Good afternoon and welcome to the Concord Bookshop. Jack Beatty joined the Atlantic Monthly as a senior editor in September of 1983, having previously worked as a book reviewer at Newsweek and a literary editor of the New Republic. In addition to editing many of the Atlantic's major nonfiction pieces, Jack is in charge of the book review section and has contributed numerous articles to the magazine himself. He's also a news analyst on WBUR's nationally syndicated On Point and is the author of The World According to Peter Drucker and The Rascal King, The Life and Times of James Michael Curley. His latest book, Age of Betrayal, The Triumph of Money in America, 1865 to 1900, is an account of the industrialization in the post-Civil War era and the shift from Lincoln's government of the people to the interpretation of the 14th Amendment by the Supreme Court recognizing corporations as individuals, leading to a period which valued wealth over commonwealth. You'll meet familiar names such as Carnegie, Stanford, and Gould in this book, and names which may be less familiar, but no less influential, such as Supreme Court Justice Stephen Field and Tom Scott, president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, in this wide-ranging and thought-provoking history. So without further ado, it's the Concord Bookshop's pleasure to present Jack Beatty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for coming out. Well, let me just, uh, to begin with, let me just read the, the uh, motto or the, the quotation with which I begin this book. This is from John Stuart Mill right after the Civil War. He writes, re he's talking about America, reason and right feeling on any public s subject has a better chance of being favorably listened to and finding the national mind open to comprehend it than at any previous time in American history. This great benefit will probably not last out the generation which fought the war. It all depends on making the most of it before the national mind has time to get crusted over with any fresh set of prejudices. Uh, that feeling of the United States being plastic, that we could begin again, uh, Lincoln and Gettysburg address a new birth of freedom, that was a, a feeling that many people had right after the Civil War. Uh, I quote the, the exultancy in the House at passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865 banning slavery. People were, were weeping. Uh, there was a feeling that, th that we were going to become one nation after all. Um, and and there was a sense that that pro that that uh, you know, the nation had made promises. One pro one promise was uh, really the promise that Lincoln made in the in the, de in the Gettysburg Address: the government uh, of, 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 of the people, by the people, and for the people. But that is what we would have in America. We didn't really have that before the Civil War partly because of the nature of the, of the franchise in the South, and the, the weighted Southern vote because of the three-fifths clause in the Constitution, uh, and, and partly because the, uh, the Southern way of life was aristocratic. It was, a, it was an aristocracy of the few. And, uh, and there was a general sense that even though the North outweighed the South, population and the rest, that the South had a stranglehold on the government. Certainly all through the 1850s they did. And one, one blow after another they, they struck at, at the northern uh, uh, feeling of, of being essentially uh, uh, cornered in their own country. I mean the Kansas Nebraska Act, the caning of Senator Sumner, of course the, the fugitive slave law and the, and the, uh, in the uh, Dred Scott decision, one thing after another seemed to, to Northern opinion just to be outraging the, their sense of what this country could be. We now know that there was a case working its way up through the New York courts that would have taken Dred Scott a step further. Dred Scott meant you could take your slave into another property, take it into another slave state, a free state without any interruption of your property, and they don't take anyone taking it. Uh, and, uh, and this case would have extent, would have legalized slavery in the North. It would have made its way to the Tawny Court. That was the court of Dred Scott. And it was hanging by a thread. Now, 
Now, whether that court would have voted on that, but it would have pretty nearly legalized slavery again in the northern states, which had, which had abolished slavery, some of them going back into the 18th century, some of them as late as the 1840s. So uh, there was a real feeling of the country being for the South, for the aristocracy, and for the slave uh, And Lincoln, uh, his, he, he revolted against that whole picture, partly just at the level of democracy, at the idea that the people should rule. And before the war, he felt that the court ruled, and the Southern aristocracy ruled. And, and the gerrymandered uh, house ruled for the southern aristocracy, but that the people didn't rule. And the southern planters called his voters mudsills and mechanics. Mudsills and mechanics. Uh, well, when the war ended, there was a sense of three promises having been made. One, that we would restore democracy, government of the people at last after this long feeling of the government being captured partly by the Supreme Court through things like Dred Scott and by the Arista the Southern plantocracy. We would, we would, we would, the United States would, would revive democracy, government of the people. The mudsills and mechanics would be the people who won the war and the government would be for them. The second promise was the feeling uh, that uh, what Lincoln called uh, the right to rise. The, Repu the Republican Party devised an ideology before the Civil War that was an answer to the propaganda of the, of the, of the Southern uh, slave uh, publicists. And, and in their picture of things, uh, there was slave labor. Over here, there was wage labor. And they admitted that went on in New England and the factories. But there was this other thing called free labor. And free labor, Lincoln really defined it as the right to rise. Republicans believed in that. And Lincoln's model was that, uh, you know, you, a, a man, penniless man, would go to work for somebody, save up his money, and then in due time, if it were a farm, he'd buy his own farm, he'd hire another penniless person, that person would work for a while, save his money, and he'd buy a farm. If it were a small shop, the same model. That was the right to rise. The right to rise said this was not a class society. This was a mobile society, where once you took the fetters off people, they would rise. That was the center of the Republican ideology. And they really felt that wage labor was a, Lincoln really thought that there was something, people had weak characters who succumbed to wage labor. But that was a, basically an episode that would pass, would be a nation of small businesses. Uh, and, and individual proprietors. That's what the, the right to rise meant to Lincoln and to the Republican Party. And of course, the third promise, and the one that was most, uh, sort of the, the one more, most morally charged, was the promise of emancipation. Not simply uh, freedom for the slaves, but rights, equality under the law, that we would finally have a, a, a democracy in which all citizens counted. Those were the three promises that the war made. Those were the causes for which people fought. You know, uh, letters from Union soldiers that show how they really felt they were fighting uh, just for, for people like themselves, just ordinary people to have a say in government, not through this southern plantocracy. Uh, and those promises were broken after the Civil War. Uh, the, the, and, I, and that's what this book is about, how this sense that the country was tabula rasa, we could begin again, how that all went wrong and why it went wrong. Uh, the, 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 the promise of democracy, of government. You know, uh, I actually started into this book when I found a, a, uh, something from Rutherford B. Hayes' diaries in the 1880s, retired as president, a five times w wounded Civil War veteran, Hayes of the 23rd, in the war for the whole length of the war, right up uh, to the end. And he writes in his diary, this is a government uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. No longer it is a government uh, for, uh, of the corporation, by the corporation, mm -hmm. and for the corporation. That's the President of the United States writing that. Mm -hmm. well, what happened? What, what, how, could, how could that promise have?
have so uh, miscarried. Uh, and uh, I, I, I go, go through the reasons, and there, there, there are many, but one of them was the connection between government and business. Basically, in this period, the government, uh, the government worked for business. Now, part of it was a positive idea that in order to encourage economic growth, the Republican Party believed in what they called the fostering hand of government. Government would reach down that fostering hand and help industry uh, uh, modernize and, 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 become, and become successful. It would do it through the tariff, which was essentially a, a, a saying, listen, you don't have to compete with foreign goods for the next however long, and we'll protect you, and you can develop your business without being undersold by foreign labor or foreign manufacturing. Big, big promise and an important one, the fostering hand of government. The other promise was to ordinary people. We'll have a homestead act. We'll, ha we'll allow free land to any man or woman who wants it, and, and some women, by the way, did, were the sole homesteaders, uh, in the West. We'll develop the West, at the same time reach the fostering hand of government down to the factory worker in, in Massachusetts who, you know, all he wants to do is get out of that factory, go out to the wide open spaces and, and become a successful farmer or a small businessman. Well, uh, I have a chapter on the Homestead Act and how that element of Republican ideology quickly went, uh, uh, quickly was aborted. Uh, the, the, a study of, of uh, Lowell and Fall River, than which there were no more industrialized cities in the United States, over a 50-year period could find not one, not one mechanic that is, that's laborer who went west. Not one. <laughs> from, from, from these two in, industry And the Republican model was, yes, the fellow will be in wage labor, but he won't be a wage laborer for the rest of his life. He won't, we won't have a British class system here. The he, will, he will go out west and start anew as a free, independent uh, entrepreneur. Not one in 50 years. And then when, the, when, when finally people said, well, why aren't more people taking advantage of this promise of free land? They realized, well, it wasn't really free. By the 1870s, to start a farm uh, cost anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500. You'd have had to have that money put by. No one had that money put by. No wage laborer could. So, so in the 70s, a, a Pennsylvania... Uh, uh, Congressman proposed that the government not only give the land but subsidize the purchase. You know, kind of like loans to people. And so you you get the the government would pay for your seed corn, it would pay for your for your tools and so on, and you'd pay that back over time. And that was voted down. Why? Paternalism. <laughs> this was paternalism. This was going too far. Already laissez faire, at least toward ordinary people and toward helping people was in the ascendant. The fostering hand of government did not reach to the ordinary person. It reached it through the tariff on the one hand, through land grants to railroads on the other, and through a multiplicity of favors for other corporations. More and more that hand was all about fostering them. Uh, and the, the, the uh, part of this was, as I say, let's encourage economic growth, let's help. But part of it also was politicians could be, were paid. This was the high tide. Uh, Vernon Parrot, uh, Parrington called this period the Great Barbecue. You know, when everybody got in on the act, eating up the riches of America because the politicians were turning government over to the uh, two businesses. And I have a, I have a picture of the, of of why uh, so many people in this era. Uh, seem disillusioned. I, I have a sense really of why why Hayes would come to that to, the, to that uh, picture of what government was all about. And this is in at the beginning of a chapter called Anti-Democracy. Gilded Age politics induces pertinent despair about democracy. Representative government gave way to bot government. Politicians betrayed the public trust. 
Citizens sold their votes, dreams faded, ideals died of their impossibility, cynicism poisoned hope. The United States in these years took on the liniments of a Latin American party state. An oligarchy ratified in rigged elections, girded by bayonets, and given a genial historical gloss by its raffish casting. Jay Gould, the Wall Street fixer, was president. He never ran for office. He never lost office. He ruled. He wrote the laws. He interpreted the Constitution. He commanded the army. He staffed the government. He rented politicians. He was John D. Rockefeller, James J. Hill, Andrew Carnegie, Tom Scott, and George Pullman. And this was his time. This was his country. Uh, that feeling of was, was was really what Hayes what Hayes was registering that that democracy had been had been substantially uh, abridged. And in my chapter, I show how even the rules of representation were ruled were were rigged against popular rule in the Gilded Age. Uh, in Connecticut, for example. One, the little town of Union, which I think had 300 people, it had the same number of representatives in the in the Connecticut legislature as New Haven, which had you know 150,000 people by that time. Again, rigged against majority rule. <coughs> and of course, in the South, that's another story entirely. How uh, how the how uh, you know essentially that became a one-party dictatorship, oligarchy under the Democrats. Uh, so this feeling of democracy having been betrayed, it's in everything you read in this period. Um, and you know, you, you, there are one-liners that sum it up. To Henry Demarest Lloyd, the muckraker, he writes, Standard Oil did everything to the Pennsylvania legislature except refine it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that really, I think, telescopes the whole feeling of uh, and, and what, what, is, what this corruption of politics by business, by favor-seeking businesses, really was about was government, was, the businesses were hiring repression. This wasn't just a matter of, you know, it was indecorous or it was, uh, you know, oh, wow, these, these crooked politicians. This was, a, this was about hiring muscle, about hiring the National Guard, about <coughs> hiring, uh, you know, private armies to put down the workers, to put down the, the, the mudsills and mechanics trying to organize, having their strikes. I, I point out that over, over a 20-year period, at least 150 times the National Guard was called out in one kind or another of labor disturbance, and almost always, almost always, to put people down, and, and often violent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I have a chapter on the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 showing that, in showing Pittsburgh becoming a scene of guerrilla warfare with the, the guardsmen uh, using Gatling guns in the streets and, 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 the, and the whole of the Pennsylvania Railroad's property being, being, being <laughs> fired, lit up by the, uh, by the furious uh, Pens uh, Pittsburgh. So this, uh, this, this idea that it, the fostering hand of government also meant the, the, the male fist, that that's what they were buying. Uh, and again, all working to that feeling that democracy had been suppressed. Well, then the other promise of Lincoln's was this idea of free labor, the right to rise, the right to rise. There was a great deal of movement in America. There's a, fi a fine essay by Stephen Thurstrom at Harvard called Men in Motion. The kind of, uh, people were moving everywhere. I think something like in the millions of people went through the city of Boston in a period of 15 or 20 years. It was just unbelievable the amount of the numbers of people who churned into a city and then went off. Uh, but uh, not much, in fact, very little uh, economic. The right to rise was frustrating. Uh, another book of Thernstrom's, he documents Newburyport, a, a shipbuilding town, but also an industrial town. Over a, I'm going to say a 50-year period, he could find no case, or very few cases, of working people, mechanics, rising to any level of supervisory position. The right to rise, they, there was geographic mobility and house mobility. Someone moved to a better house, so they left. But there wasn't rising. There wasn't rising. 
And, you know, uh, part of the reason there wasn't rising was that the, the viability of small business was increasingly under pressure. One of the great discoveries of our civilization is scale and scope production. Uh, in his great book on this, uh, Alfred Chandler at the Harvard Business Group said that's the th those constitute the dynamics of industrial capitalism. And that scale and scope production came to America with the railroad. I have a chapter showing how the railroad transformed uh, the Middle West. In fact, I, I, I quote the Joseph Schumpeter really created the Middle West. And I, and I focus on Chicago, especially on how that city was a creation of railroad. But not only did the, the railroad settle uh, the West, it made possible the con uh, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, Chandler calls throughput. You could finally, in a factory, have constant uh, input of the material you needed to make what you're making. And the, and the train not only could bring you the supply, it could, it could send your, your product to people who were previously lost to distance. It, the, the railroad, in my, as I put it in my chapter, title, annihilated American space. That's the phrase that the railroad boomers use, you know, annihilating space. So scale and scope production was a fabulous discovery. But of course, but, but, but as we all know, it works against the little man. You know, I have an example of an Akron butcher who wanted to, you know, he's trying to sell meat. And sure enough, Armour from Chicago, which is one of the first companies the meatpacking people were to, to apply scale and scope production. Uh, Armour sends a, 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 a refrigerated car to Akron and starts selling meat off the car for practically nothing. And the butcher says, I, I can't compete. I just got to... I, I've got to throw up my hands. So all over the country, there was a centralization of the meat industry. That was one of the first industries. But that model of the little man unable to compete with the, with scale production and with scope production, that is, you can make more than one product off the same production cycle, uh, that worked against the little person. It, it frustrated the right to rise. And, uh, and, and then again, factory employment. Uh, you know, you work in a factory for 12 hours a day. When, when can you rise? You know, what, what leisure do you have to devote yourself to, to uh, moving up in the world? Education, there was public education, but it only went so far. And one of the tragic things I document here is how uh, uh, child labor increased through the 19th century, such that, you know, in the 1880s, uh, Rhode Island, the tariff-made state of Rhode Island, where the fostering hand was working to keep all those industries, some with tariffs of 60% uh, alive, that didn't prevent families from having this needing to send their children to school, I mean, to, to, to work. And uh, there's, a, there's a study of Buffalo and, on, and, and uh, Kingston, Ontario in this area that really documents this. Before industrialization in these towns, there was no difference uh, really discernible between upper class people and lower class people in, in their use of schools for children. They both pretty much had their kids going to school. Uh, once industrialization came in and the factory opened, it didn't change for the upper class factory. They didn't need to send their child to, to, uh, to work. But suddenly, the lower class family, they had to choose. Do you go to school or do you go to work? Go to work. And that meant, you know, the, the right to rise was aborted, killed in its crib by sending these children to work. Uh, and, you know, Mark, Karl Marx has wonderful passages about, just, you know, how... Um, how, you know, occupations that were once reserved for athletic blacksmiths are now done by children 10 or 11. And he says, you know, in capitalist anthropology, 11 is the age of adulthood. Uh, and it was, and I, I go through New Jersey where, where they would test kids, these factory children. Uh, you know, who was George Washington? Uh, he discovered America. Uh, uh, what is, uh, you know, England, uh, a comma? Uh, where does the president live? On the moon. 
couldn't have mobility there when, pa when families desperate were sending their children to work. Uh, and of course, they weren't doing that to live the life fantastic, but to survive under miserable uh, working conditions and with very meager wages. Democ uh, 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 you know, the right to rise frustrated. Uh, you know, as terrible as the betrayal of these promises uh, really, really uh, uh, was, the, the, pro the, the betrayal of emancipation was the most bitter and the one that most indicts American civilization of this period. Basically, the, the freedman was betrayed. The four million slaves in the South were, were the 14th Amendment was passed for them to protect them, uh, protect their rights, to guarantee them equality uh, before the law. And there was a, and something happened, something really um, terrible happened, which I put in two chapters, one called The Inverted Constitution and the other, the scandal of Santa Clara. And I'll begin with the, just the first paragraph of the inverted constitution. This will give you the sense. That these dead shall not have died in vain, Lincoln resolved at Gettysburg, death still setting the air four months after the battle. Cleansed of slavery by their blood, the nation would experience a new birth of freedom. Lincoln was prophetic. Constitutionally, the United States had a new founding after the Civil War with three freedom amendments as its charter. At last, an every man's constitution for, quote, this is quoting from the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States codify what John Hope Franklin called one of the basic social revolutions in the history of humanity. The Congresses that passed these amendments, the 13th, ending slavery, the 14th, extending equal protection of laws to the nearly 4 million freedmen, and the 15th, establishing that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, the Congresses that passed these bills knew the demobilizing Union Army could not enforce them against the resistance of the South, where more than 500,000 men had served recently in the, Confederate, in the Confederate armed forces. So they looked to the authority of the federal courts to protect the rights of the free. Yet, exercising its power in Chief Justice John Marshall's words to say what the law is, the Supreme Court refused the part Congress assigned it. In an 1883 opinion overturning the Civil Rights Act of 1875, banning racial discrimination in public accommodations, Justice Joseph P. Bradley voiced the court's prevailing sentiments. Blacks must cease to be the special favorite of the laws. The laws had a new favorite. There is nothing which is lawful to be done, Stephen J. Field, one of five justices appointed by Lincoln, wrote in a later opinion that reads like an introduction to St. Francis of Assisi, there is nothing which is lawful to be done to feed and clothe our people, to beautify and adorn our dwellings, to relieve the sick, to help the needy, and to enrich and ennoble humanity, which is not to a great extent done through the instrumentalities of corporations. <laughs> the new constitution, as, import, as interpreted by the court, applied to economic, not to civil rights. <clears throat> the person whose life, liberty, or property the 14th Amendment secured was not the freedman, but the corporation. Within 15 years of its ratification, every man's constitution gave way to the inverted constitution. And I, my chapters are about the, this is, this is usually, uh, the betrayal is usually couched in terms of the a compromise of 1877, whereby the Republicans kept the White House in return for agreeing to basically leave the, take the last federal troops out of the South and leave the uh, the freedmen to the tender mercies of the white of white of white supremacy. That was the, the corrupt bargain, as it was called. But I talk about the Supreme Court's role, and uh, which is which is much less well known, and the 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 bitter. Um, Elements of it. Uh, the uh, I, I I show how a a uh, 
I show how a, uh, an event in Louisiana uh, helped to shape the new, uh, the new, the new jurisprudence. Uh, and I and I talk about the the uh, I talk about this 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 Colfax, Louisiana, in the white in the white cemetery of Colfax, Louisiana, above the headstone stands a marble ob obelisk bearing this inscription: "In loving remembrance, erected to the hero, the memory of the heroes Stephen Decatur Parrish, James West Hadnot, Sidney Harris." who fell in the Colfax riot fighting for white supremacy, April 13, 1873. There had been an election in Louisiana in, in November 1872. The Republicans can't claim their candidate won. They elected the governor. The Democrats said, no, no, our candidate won. Essentially, there were two governments. Uh, violence leaked out from uh, New Orleans. Uh, Colfax County saw, parish saw the worst. Named for Grant's Vice President Schuyler Koufax and the county seat of the recently created Grant Parish in the state's Black Belt, Koufax consisted of a few plantation buildings. Its courthouse was a converted stable. In January, the Democrats installed their candidates for sheriff and county judge. In late March, on the authority of the Republican governor, Republican officials steamed up river from New Orleans to dislodge the opposition from the courthouse. Helped by a black boy who climbed through a window and unlatched the door, the Republican sheriff and judge got inside and evicted the Democrats who fled Colfax. After hearing rumors that the Democrats wanted them hung, these white Republicans deputized local blacks to defend the government they had elected, because of course the Republican Party was the party of African Americans who voted in this Republican government. <coughs> While three black ex-Union soldiers drilled the deputies, bands of whites menaced the village, and shots were traded. Nobody died in these exchanges, Nicholas Lemon writes in his searing book, Redemption, The Last Battle of the Civil War. But the effect on the whites of encountering se successful black armed self-defense, a thing constantly feared through centuries of slavery, but hardly ever realized, would be hard to overstate. In early April, just outside Colfax, a black farmer fencing his property was shot through the head. At word of Jesse McKinney's murder, black families fled to Colfax for safety. On the 13th, a very considerable force of white men in military form formation, towing a small cannon, and led by Columbus Nash, the Democratic sheriff, descended on Colfax. The white Republican judge had gone back to New Orleans for help. The white sheriff stayed in Colfax, but as soon as he saw the fight was impending, he left and got out of the way, Henry C. Beckworth, the U.S. attorney for New Orleans, told a congressional committee a year later, adding, I believe there was a school teacher, a white man, at or about the courthouse, but he left and got out of the way, so that at the time the attack was made, there was no person in the crowd around the courthouse that was not colored. The Negroes were there relying solely upon their own strength for protection. Perhaps half were armed, a few with Enfield rifles, the rest with shotguns. In a parlay with Levin Allen, one of the former soldiers in charge of the courthouse, Nash demanded, surrender your arms and disperse. Allen refused. We're going to get him, Nash said. I'll see you when you get him, Allen replied. He was given a half hour to evacuate the women and children. Just past noon, Nash's men deployed in a skirmish line and, from beyond the range of the defender's shotgun, opened rifle fire on the low earthworks the blacks had thrown up in front of the court. The two-and-a-half-inch bore cannon decided the battle. The whites flanked the earth earthworks with the cannon and raked the line of black defenders with hot iron shards. The line broke some of the blacks falling back on the courthouse, others retreating toward the riverbank. Whites on horseback pursued them and, as Attorney Beckworth put it in his testimony, slaughtered all within their reach. The whites told the prisoner Pinckney Chambers they would spare his life if he set fire to the courthouse roof. With both sides shooting over him, he worked his way up to the courthouse and, using a bundle of fodder tied to a long pole, fired the roof. Some of the men inside tried to knock the burning shingles free, but bullets drove them to cover. 
Soon, the fiery roof collapsed onto the ceiling above the defenders. Men on fire began leaping from the window. With minutes to go before the fire consumed them all, one man flapped a white page of a record book, another a patch of white sleeve to signify surrender. Come out! We won't shoot, the white shouted. The blacks came out in waves and were shot down, and the wounded were bayoneted and their bodies hacked with knives. The whites match, marched the survivors into a nearby cotton field. The battle over, the massacre was about to begin. That night, 47 prisoners were called by name, two at a time, and taken out into the road that ran through the plantation and past the ruins of the courthouse, and several white men mounted formed behind them in Beckwith's words. Benjamin Brin, an old man who had played dead to escape the fusillade at the courthouse door, stood toward the rear of the line. He heard gunfire. The whites were shooting their way up the line, putting a bullet in the back of each black head. The firing had reached back near to his vicinity when he heard a pistol cocked, and as he turned around to beg for his life, the man behind him shot him. Once again, he played dead as Sheriff Nash's men emptied their revolvers on his comrade. The bullet went in under Bryn's left eye, flooding his sinus cavity with blood. Blood, gagging, unable to breathe, he blew it out. Dead men don't make noise. This nigger ain't dead yet, a white man on horseback shouted and shot Bryn in the back. It started to rain and the whites sought shelter. Thus ended what Eric Foner has called the bloodiest single act of carnage in all of Reconstruction. It was Easter Sunday. When the deputy U.S. Marshal arrived from New Orleans on Tuesday morning, he counted 59 bodies, many mutilated, others burned beyond human trace. Early on Monday morning, Bryn each inched to a nearby ditch. Covering himself with weeds, he bled through the day, listening as crowd, crowds of whites plundered the dead of all that was on them. While Bryn fought off death in a Colfax ditch, that same morning in Washington, the Supreme Court handed down a tragic decision that would deny justice to the Colfax dead. The case, arose, the case before the court arose from the actions of a Louisiana corporation, a slaughterhouse. And then I go into the case, the famous slaughterhouse cases, which basically wound up uh, removing blacks from the protection of the of the 14th Amendment. And it was a tragic case because it's uh, it, opinion, because the opinion's author, <coughs> Samuel Freeman Miller, uh, was a, a uh, he, 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 you know, he was, a, he was a, a, an abolitionist before the war. He had left Kentucky because Kentucky uh, had changed its constitution and made, <coughs> made slavery even more deeply entrenched. And he, uh, he had gone to Keokuk, Iowa, and started a whole uh, a, a law practice there. He had, he had been a physician. Uh, and, and he wanted to, uh, and he believed, uh, basically, the, the case involved a, a complicated issue of the Louisiana Reconstruction government set up a grand slaughterhouse in, just to the south of the city where all the butchers cut could come and practice their trade. The, the previous to that, the slaughterhouses had been north of the city, and the offal, the entrails, all the rest, from the slaughtering of 300,000 beef a year would, were right into the, into the Mississippi and right down past New Orleans, and the, and the stuff was sucked into the reservoir. Mm -hmm. And New Orleans had a name, uh, the name of America's uh, ne necropolis, because mm -hmm. every year, at least 1,500, and several times in the 1850s, 4,000 people a year died of yellow fever or cholera. Mm -hmm. Of course, many of them were slaves at the slave auction, and people weren't all that upset about that, except that your investment was gone. But nevertheless, uh, Travelers to New Orleans were vulnerable to this, and there was just a whole. And for years, the local doctors have been trying to get them to change these, pull these slaughterhouses down, and put them south of the city so there wouldn't be. Well, when the Yankees, Benjamin Butler from up here in Lowell, when he occupied New, or New Orleans in, in, uh, in, during the Civil War, he's known for, for two things. Uh, 
his soldiers would, were spat upon on the streets of New Orleans, and there were many of them were black soldiers, by, by ladies, by white ladies of New Orleans. And he let it be known that the next woman who spat on a Union soldier would be treated as a whore. She would be treated as a prostitute, because that, that's the kind of person they would be. Well, this made incensed the South. They, they, they assassination plots against He was the most hated of Union because he was defiling Southern womanhood. Well, of course, Southern womanhood was spitting on the people who were saving the Union. And, and that stopped it. That stopped it. There was no more, there were no more spitting on Union soldiers. The other thing he's known for is closing down these, these slaughterhouses. I mean, he knew Boston had done this, other cities. Close them down, move them south of the city. Uh, by 1864, only two people died of cholera and, and yellow fever, where 1,500, 4,000 had died before. After the war, business as usual. 1867, 1,500 people died again. So the Louisiana legislature, which now is a biracial legislature, in fact, the most biracial in the, in the South, comes up with a plan to, to create a, this grand slaughterhouse have the butchers come down and practice their trade there. Uh, and it's, a high, it's based upon uh, ske similar schemes in Paris and in, uh, and in San Francisco and other, this is like the enlightened uh, uh, public health policy of the time. And the butchers, who are mostly from Gascony, uh, sued, uh, sued uh, again, the, the state of Louisiana for, for this law, they said, because it violated their economic freedom to presumably pollute the Mississippi River. And uh, uh, they, they took the case to the Supreme Court. And their, their tribune, their counsel, and he's one of my characters here, is a man named John A. Campbell, who had been on the Dred Scott Court and who'd written a, a, uh, a concurrence in the Dred Scott decision and who quit the court uh, when the war broke, bro broke out and who fought this, uh, this slaughterhouse statute uh, all the way, uh, all the way to the to the Supreme Court, and he made the argument that the Fourteenth Amendment protected the rights of these butchers to practice their ordinary calling, and it there and and that the, the, the statute therefore was invalidated. It's unconstitutional. Well, of course, it hadn't been ha passed for butchers. <laughs> it has to protect blacks from state actions that were right after the war that were almost returning slavery, and so the. So Justice Miller, in his opinion, says this. I mean, this is a, a you know, there's no, no li this idea has no liniments in the intent of the, of the framers of the 14th Amendment. And, and he sustained Louisiana. And he believed that, uh, that you know, that, that, that the Reconstruction government would remain. And, and, and this was another reason the, the Campbell and the New Orleans establishment wanted to discredit this law was that it was a biracial legislature. And the dominant, uh, you know, line in American his history and then in American historiography right up until the 1960s, the dominant line about Reconstruction was what one uh, historian of the period called Negro incapacity. After all, how could these unlettered people run decent government? In fact, the most democratic and progressive government the South ever had came from these biracial legislatures. And when the, when the whites took power back and disfranchised the blacks, the states went back to their old slatternly ways. And aid to public education was cut, and roads were built, and neglect prevailed, and factories weren't inspected, all the sorts of things that these biracial legislatures, made up of ignorant black people who hadn't gone to school, but who knew right and wrong, and who had a sense of what, and who believed in democracy. That's what's so awful about this period. The, peop, the only people who believed in democracy, in voting, in, in public uh, activity, in, in government for the people, were the free, and they were betrayed. Uh, and so I show how that happened, and basically Justice Miller, in order to meet the threat to federalism posed by this argument that the federal government could come in and overturn a state law, 
he uh, he limited what the 14th Amendment applied to. And it, it would protect blacks if they were on navigable waterways or on the high seas or other areas where the federal government had jurisdiction, but basically it had nothing to do with civil rights. Right. Tragic, because he wanting to do good to, as he put it, these unfortunate people who have suffered so much, he did them grave harm. And then the second case arriving out of this Colfax massacre uh, in 1876, <coughs> a Cruikshank case, that essentially did not, held that the, that the, uh, that the Colfax, uh, it, it permitted the people who did the murders at Colfax to go free. And, uh, and, and it's kind of an amazing, um, it's kind of an amazing turn. Um, writing for an eight to one majority, Chief Justice Waite sought to inoculate the Cruikshank decision against its moral absurdity. If a hundred white men could massacre 60 black citizens without anyone being convicted of a crime against the United States, the reasons certainly should be made clear. Indeed, the New York Times praised Waite's admirable clearness but clarity won't cleanse Cruikshank of its consequences. And its consequences were that essentially it gave a, it meant that not only were crimes against blacks not punishable locally because no one would convict, even in murders, uh, but they were not punishable federally. Uh, and the, 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 this opinion, uh, the Picayune, that's the, the Democratic paper in New Orleans, virtually annuls and arrests all the proceedings in the Grant Parish prosecutions. It was this ill start, and if I go into how that happened, uh, uh, in, in Colfax, White celebrated the decision by murdering two blacks. His own life in danger, Beckwith, the U.S. attorney, resigned in December. A new terrorist group, the White League, came to violent life, shooting white Republican electing officials, handed hanging blacks to keep its members' spirits up, and barbarously wounding Levin Allen, the former Union soldier who had defied Sheriff Nash prior to the battle at the Colfax Courthouse and who had survived the massacre, wounded him before throwing him upon a pile of brush and burning him to death. Uh, and the, 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 the Cruikshank decision, it, it was, uh, the Cruikshank and Reese, it was also another decision, Reese, which took away the vote, the 15th Amendment for black. These, these decisions were unanimous, and they seemed to displease nobody white. The Reese and Cruikshank decisions meet with the most unexpected encomiums. Wait, Chief Justice, wrote his brother a week after issuing them. The papers in New York, both Republican and Democrat, are to a certain extent enthusiastic. The New York world compared uh, Chief Justice Waite to Jay, Marshall, and Tawney, <laughs> which must have uh, brought the Chief Justice up short, to a judge on the Fourth Circuit who teased Waite about, quote, that dread decision, D-R-E-D, likening Cruikshank to Dred Scott, that dread decision of the enforcement case, Waite wrote back, sorry about the dread, but to my mind there was no escape, no escape from the slaughterhouse cases, confinement of federal citizenship. Wade apologized, and I go on, uh, and the, 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 what really happened here was, and I'll end here, was that this sort of turn away from that mood that I mentioned. Uh, the bipartisan applause echoed Northern opinion on Reconstruction, which had outlived the mood of its gestation. The cheering in the hall and densely packed galleries exceeded anything I ever saw and beguard description, George W. Julian, recall of the exultancy in the House chamber on January 35, 31, 1865, at passage of the 13th Amendment banning slavery. Members shouted and joined in the shouting and kept it up for some minutes. I have felt ever since as if I were in a new country. Belief in a unifying American nationality and in the necessity of a strong central government ran, t ran high. But as the weight of the war lifted, the pre-war political culture reasserted itself, surveying post-war policy on race, women's rights, public health, crime, charity, and education. Morton Keller traces a pattern of retreat. 
First, in the wake of the war, there was an outburst of rhetoric and action designed to implement the war-born ideal of a unified, more egalitarian nation. And then there followed the resurgence, and usually the triumph, of countering 19th century American values, laissez-faire, individualism, assumption of racial and sexual inferiority. Northerners were torn between anti-slavery and the Union before the war, Reconstruction and reunion after. They had accepted slavery where it already existed to preserve the Union. They would accept the freedmen's disfranchisement to achieve reunion. When at a public meeting at Boston's Faneuil Hall, called by highly respectable citizens, to protest General Sheridan's use of federal bayonets to evict Democrats from seats in the Louisiana Assembly, when at this meeting the abolitionist Wendell Phillips declared, my anxiety is for the hunted, tortured, robbed, murdered blacks of Louisiana, a heckler shouted, that's played out, sit down. By this time, Keller observes, Uncle Tom's cabin was not a spur to popular indignation over the mistreatment of blacks by whites, but a half-minstrel, half-circus half theatrical entertainment. A decade after the rebellion, the romance of blue and gray joined at the marriageable daughter had induced a fraternal amnesia about the war's causes. Even realists like Henry James and William Dean Howells indulged the romance of reunion. Only the foreign occupation of the South held it back, and the Negro. His hour, I usually I quote someone earlier saying, this is the Negro's hour, his hour was over. His political cover, cover vanished in 1874, when the Democrats won control of the House of Representatives for the first time since secession. His military protection ended with the Compromise of 1877, when, to hold on to the White House, his only betrayed him. With the Krupstank decision, the court issued a constitutional pass to terrorism. State courts had refused to prosecute political murder from the moment blacks ceased to be property. Between 1866 and 1875, General Sheridan estimated 3,500 people had been murdered in Louisiana, and the civil authorities, in all but a few cases, had been unable to arrest, convict, and punish the perpetrators. With the Reese decision, the court stripped blacks of their only remaining weapon against terror, self-help through the ballot box. In the year before Reese, federal attorneys brought more than 200 voting rights prosecutions, two years after Reese, 25. Upon giving Reese et al. and Kupchak et al. my severest study, the federal attorney in Charleston wrote a friend, he'd concluded that federal election laws are a delusion and a farce. Referring to bands of white vigilantes, he went on, if red shirts break up meetings by violence, there is no remedy unless it can be proved to have been done on account of race, etc., which can't be proved because the people can only peacefully, upset, peaceably assemble under the constitutional guarantees to protect Congress, ex petition Congress, etc., etc. Oh, it's hard to sit quietly and see such things with the powerful arm of the government tied behind its back by these court decisions. State officials from the governor to the precinct manager quote, reject and refuse to permit colored men to register to vote. The, the attorney had not bothered to register himself. What was the point? Suppose I vote. Will it be counted? And if I can't protect myself, how can I protect my friend of African descent? Well, that was the age of betrayal. And uh, that's why my first sentence says, this book tells the saddest story. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, so anybody has anything? Uh -huh. Yes, they were counter, they were countering, there were currents against this drift. One of them, as I say, were, were, were the, the actions of, 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 of free, of the free. In, in, uh, there's a study of where major massacres took place on, in Reconstruction. I think there were six of the places, and in four of these localities, the vote of black citizens after the massacre, designed to prevent them from voting and to terrorize them, went up. Went up. Mm -hmm. These people believe. This is a is a story of people who, who said, "This is we're we're, doing, we're 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 having our rights here." That I think is the most moving thing. And I think 
I, the, the second thing to me is the populist revolt. I don't get into that here, but I have a chapter on it. And in the South, the populists were the first white men to turn to the black and say, who could still vote into the 90s, but not so much, and say, look, look, you know, we're divided by, by, by we, we have the same economic interests. Race divides us, class unites us. Let's join against the tariff mongers. Let's join against this, the plutocrats, as they call them, and make common <coughs> cause. And, uh, and that was a, a relation that is, I find, among the most moving things in the book. And, you know, there's a scene that I end my chapter with where, where uh, there had been a, a, a Tom Watson, a populist politician, uh, running for Congress. Was, he had a black uh, minister, Reverend Doyle, who went with him speaking to the black group saying, vote for me and we'll break the democratic oligarchy and we'll be good for your, uh, 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 you, you as a farmer. He was threatened with lynching, Reverend Lynch was, and uh, Reverend Doyle. And that night, the word went out through the, to the populists in the vicinity. And all, you know, uh, and I draw this picture of, uh, you know, uh, uh, all through the, I think for as far away as, uh, as uh, anyway, nearly a hundred miles from a hundred miles, people, farmers, uh, who had um, got word of this, and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> maybe Tom Watson contrived Reverend Doyle's peril. That's uncertain. But the white farmers rubbing sleep from their eyes, collecting their rifles, saddling their horses, hitching their teams, and riding through the Georgia night to protect a black comrade from lynching and maybe die doing it, that was real. That was the best of populism. In all these bitter years, you will find nothing so moving. And that is why the Democrats crushed the populists. They played the race card. They shot uh, black voters at the polls. They, they did everything they could because the populace threatened white supremacy. And uh, that, that's the great... So the populists, mm -hmm. I think, right, they wanted government to work for the people. And it was called the People's Party. And it arose in Texas and in Kansas mm -hmm. and in Georgia. And everywhere there was oligarchy, everywhere the government worked for the corporations, that was the instigating uh, force for for populism, and it's the to this day the populists remain our native democratic radicals. Nothing socialist about it. They wanted they wanted competition. They wanted the small person to be able to survive, and they were generous, and they had a generous biracial vision. So, what about the tariff? Oh, the tariff. Well, you know, the tariff. Uh, uh, it, it was it was part of the Republican plan, and many economists. They hate to admit it. Pointed out that it correlated with all kinds of good things. The United States was an agricultural arcade in the 1850s. In 1913, we surpassed Germany as the most industrialized power on the country, in, on the planet. Why? Well, tariff protection had a lot to do with it. And uh, did did it did it benefit it benefited tariff long you know uh, big industrialists? Didn't benefit workers so much. They claimed it did. But it was just this idea, and, and even economic, e economic historians have long since said, well, it worked, didn't it? And economic economists hate the idea. They, even, uh, one, one researcher couldn't find a single paper arguing for the success of the tariff before 1980. Because it's heresy to an economist to believe that managed trade is, could be superior to uh, to a free trade, but of course, in our own time, Japan and Korea rose to industrial preeminence the same way the United States did through protection, through managed trade. But the, it, it is such her in the in the in this day, it was the University of Pennsylvania ban had a sign and a, a, a thing saying if you were a teacher of economics, you would you would not teach the doctrine of free trade. <laughs> well, just today there is an equal ban on anyone saying anything about tariffs or protection or manage. Oh, you can't talk about that. That's so. Uh, uh, and the Democrats are talking about it because uh, you know uh, Sherrod Brown, a new senator from uh, from Ohio, he talks about Lima, Ohio. He talks about Hamilton. He talks about.
these towns that once were thriving and people had a middle class life that have gone down now, gone down because the industries have gone to Mexico, because they've gone to China, because the imports are cheaper. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, these are our people. Are we just going to let them go? Is that the idea? You're expendable, you work for 40 years, and then the company goes to Mexico and won't pay your pension? Is that fair? Uh, so people are feeling that globalization is not work. It is not working, by the way, for the ordinary person. One estimate is that about 25% of the fall in real wages in this country since the 1970s is owing to globalization. It's great for the big guys. It's bad for the little guy. Rather like the tariff, but in reverse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the farmer was one of the both beneficiaries of the policies after the war and victim. And basically, he was victim victimized by product, agricultural productivity. Uh, the railroad made it possible for, and, and, and the West made it possible for, you know, when Malthus wrote his prognostication about, you know, uh, the, 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 the demand for sustenance and exceeding the ability to provide it, and therefore population control, uh, one laborer could support one, feed one person, or two laborers, or two farmers could feed uh, one person. Uh, by the time, by the 1870s, one farmer could feed about 150 people. Uh, and, and this was the mechanization of agriculture. And, uh, and there was a kind of uh, cycle. As the, big, as the big farms opened in the Midwest and then in the Plain States, New England and New York State went out of the agriculture business. That's when those, those, those ruined walls in the, in the Berkshires, that's when people left. Because they were cycle, they couldn't compete with this scale and scope production in agriculture. Now you could get the p potatoes could get to New York City just as fast as somebody from, you know, I don't know, New Jersey uh, could. Uh, truck farms did well. Farms that were near cities stayed alive even into our own day. Mm -hmm. But anything large, it went to scale and scope production applied to agriculture, and. One of the things that happened, the, 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 the Republicans had hoped that factory workers would go to the farm and uh, become independent, independent people. In fact, what happened was the factory went to the farm. <laughs> Bigger, uh, you know, big machines, mechanization, and farm laborers, and child labor. All the things that had happened with the industry now began to happen to agriculture. I show that happening. So, okay. anyway, thank you very much for coming.